Good evening. This is Sharon Kleck with Mind Messiah Ministries in Missouri, Southern Missouri. And I want to share some things with you this evening that I taught at a recent conference. We had a follow-up teaching after the last warfare conference. And in that, there were four of us teachers. Each of us had 15 minutes and we had an assignment. My assignment was to explain to those that are wanting to learn to move in spiritual warfare and to move uh, to learn to do deliverance exactly who the devil is. How does he show up in scripture and who is he? I was surprised at the response because even some of the seasoned warriors were very interested in what I was sharing and they asked for me to do that again so that it could get recorded. So before I go any further, I'm going to ask you to please do this for me. Please leave your comments below. I'm not the only teacher on this. I'm sure that you all have learned other things. Maybe you can add to what I'm sharing. And if you would please just leave your comments and I'll be glad to get back to you. We all learn from one another. And so I just thank you for taking the time to listen. Please give us a thumbs up a like and please subscribe ring that bell so that the next time that i teach that you'll get that information sent to you right away so i'm pretty sure i can't do this in 15 minutes but we're going to try to do it the best we can and not drag it out well all of us know even little kids know this that the devil showed up in the garden of eden what was he doing there how did he get there but we really don't know from the scriptures. There's a lot of speculation and even some of explanations in extra biblical writings. There are some really good teachers that have done a lot of research that have come up with great things. I have mentioned this before. I learned a lot from Michael Heiser. His books are very good. Not only him, there's there's a number of them um, that, that have done great research that are uh, a Hebrew linguist and have gone into the original scrolls and just broke things down and helped us to understand things a little bit better. Today, we're going to stick just with the word of God, that the Bibles that all of us have in our possession and with the translations that we have available. So Adam and Eve, God's creation, they're placed in the garden and they're, they're told that they're there to tend it. So the word to tend it or to guard it is the word shamar in the Hebrew. That's what, what Adam was supposed to be doing. He was supposed to be guarding the garden. Obviously, he didn't do a very good job at that. What happened was that the shining, talking serpent shows up, and he's very beautiful. And he told them that if they would eat of this tree of good and evil which God told them not to. It was in the midst of the garden. God told them not to eat of it. But if they did, they would be like God. Well, they already were. They already were. They they were created in the image of God. They were head over, had dominion over, and they were ruling the whole earth. They were over the fish of the seas, the birds of the air, everything that creeped upon the face of the earth. And they were given dominion over all of those things. But somehow the devil made it sound like that God was withholding something from them. Often we have that attitude. We feel like we're not good enough to be healed. We're not good enough to be saved. We're not good enough for God to allow certain things to happen in our life, for us to find the right mate, for us to have the right job. All of that's a lie. It's all a lie from the devil. He told Adam and Eve the very same lie. It showed up in the garden and it's showing up every day in many of your lives. So this shining one is talking to Adam and Eve and um, he says to them, you're going to be like gods. Well, here we have the very first biblical glimpse of the character Satan. The truth is, is that he's a liar. He's a liar from the very beginning. If his mouth is moving, he is lying. And at best, he's telling a half truth. He always throws in a half truth because his specialty is mixed seed. Oh, we'll just reason this out. This sounds like a good thing to do. It's the Bible says don't do it, but it sounds like it's an okay thing to do. We're doing stuff like that all the time. What about all these all these people that are going to get tattoos? They, I mean, the Bible says not to put marks on your body. 
But it, there's a reasoning for that. I mean, after all, everybody else is doing it. It can't hurt. God doesn't really care. It doesn't affect my salvation. We're still reasoning. We're still reasoning things out. What about the person who decides that they want to have an abortion? After all, they're too young to raise a child. It makes good sense. God understands. Well, let's take a look at what the Bible says. In this next passage, Jesus, Yeshua, is speaking to the religious leaders when he's here on earth. In John 8, 44, he says, you are of your father, the devil. He's talking to religious leaders and he tells them that their father is the devil. Well, if that's true, that means Satan has children and they're human beings. And your will is to do your father's desire. This is what Jesus says. He was a murderer from the very beginning. So his point or his goal, his objective for you is death. He's a murderer from the very beginning. And he, he doesn't stand in truth. He does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. There isn't any truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character. If you are prone to lie, you are demonstrating the character of Satan himself because that's his character. He is a liar for he is a liar and the father of lies. So when the devil shows up, Adam and Eve have had a relationship with God. They're walking with him and they spoke freely with him every day. They have an intimate relationship with him. They're already gods of this earth in that they are rulers and they have dominion over the entire earth. They rule over all of the earth and they were created to rule. You probably don't realize it. You are, as humankind, created to rule. You are created to have dominion. You were created in God's image to rule. You are humankind. You are created in God's image and you were created to rule. They had dominion over everything. We just mentioned that. Everything on the face of the earth. And when they were expelled from the garden, because that's what God did after they obeyed Satan rather than obeying God, Adam and Eve, they didn't lose a garden. They lost a kingdom. So we're instructed in the scriptures to pray for God's kingdom to come to earth again. It's God's intention and purpose to restore to mankind and to restore us to the garden position that we once had had as it was in the beginning if you look at the end of the book it's like the beginning of the book we start in a garden and we end in a garden the new heaven and the new earth is just spectacular with all the trees that line the river that comes from the throne of god it's gorgeous so he wants to restore us as in the beginning our destiny is to rule and to reign with him in eternity uh, where there's going to be no more death, Satan is the author of death. No more death, no more tears, and the lion will lay down with the wolf. And there will be no more fear or aggression. That lion or that lamb will not have to fear that wolf. The wolf's not going to turn it, tear it to pieces because there's no more aggression. So it wasn't good enough for Adam to be like God, he wanted to be a God, which is the same sin of Satan that got him thrown out of heaven in the first place. He wanted to take God's place. And we're going to read that in the scriptures. Adam was created in the image of God. Satan was not. He is a cherub. He is not created in God's image. He was never given dominion over the earth. And that was given to Adam. So Satan went about to steal that right to rule from Adam, to steal his authority. So that's what we're going to look at today. If we take a look at Romans 6, 16, it says, it gives us this principle of what happened in the garden. Romans 6, 16, know you not that to whom you yield yourself servants, 
to obey his servants you are to whom you obey. So whoever you choose to make master in your life, whoever you choose to obey, if you want to listen to those voices that aren't coming from God and you choose to obey, well, that becomes your master. The word says so. Whether of sin or of unto death. So when you sin, that leads to death. Or of obedience unto righteousness. So when you're obedient to the things of God, that leads to righteousness. When you choose to obey the voice of Satan, that leads to death. So you and I can choose who we're going to serve. One of the greatest gifts that we've been given in this life is our free will. God does not force us to love him or even to obey him. That's our choice. That's your choice. If we allow sin into our lives, we're submitting to the author of sin, the devil. And we will pay the consequences of following him in any area of your life. So the New Living Translation says in John 10.10, 10, the thief's purpose is to steal, to kill, to destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich and a satisfying life. So Satan will steal your finances. He will kill your body, and he will destroy your relationships and the people that you love. So that word to kill means to slaughter, as in a sacrifice. So that's what he thinks of you. You are meat for his sacrifice. The word destroy means to perish. He wants to annihilate you, for you to exist no more. God has a plan to restore humankind. He knew the end from the beginning, and he declared that in Genesis 3, 15. And that reads this way, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. So Satan has a seed, and the woman has a seed. It shall bruise the, thy head. So the woman's seed's going to bruise the devil's head. And you're going to bruise, or Satan's seed is going to bruise the heel of her seed. So this is the beginning of the seed war. This is where we see Satan has seed. In Psalms 58, 3, it says, The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they're born, speaking lies. Why are they speaking lies? Well, because they're of the father, the devil, the father of lies. Verse 4, their poison is like the poison of a serpent. So Psalmist is telling us that there are people that are like serpents. I know, none of that's great news. So let's take a look at how all of this started. And we're going to see also how it ends. So let's look at Ezekiel 28. We're going to start in verse 11. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation unto the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus says the Lord, Thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. So we know that this is not an earthly, physical, human being king. This king was in Eden. I think that tells us clearly who this is. And it's going to give us more description that will make it more clear. So we know it's not an earthly king. Every precious stone, the scripture continues, every precious stone was I covering the sardis, the topaz, the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, oh, in gold, 
and the workmanship of your tabrets. That word tabrets means tambourine. And of thy pipes was prepared in thee from the day that you were created. So this is why many believers think that Satan was in charge of worship in heaven because his very body was obviously a musical instrument. He has tambourines within him. He has pipes within him. In verse 14, thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. So we believe that he covered the throne of God at one time. He provided a protective covering. He was a hedge. He was a defense. He had a great start. And the word continues here, and I have set thee so. So God's the one who appointed him or bestowed this upon him. And the word continues, thou was upon the holy mountain of God, and you've walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Verse 15, thou was perfect, perfect in all of your ways from the day that you were created until, until. Iniquity was found in thee. So it says he was perfect in his ways. And that word in the Strong's Concordance is H8549. It means morally, in, with integrity and truth. He was without blemish. He was complete and sound. He was without spot. He was undefiled. He was upright. And then iniquity was found in him. Well, the word iniquity is H5766. That means evil, perverseness, unjust, unrighteousness, wickedness. So he goes from being perfect and undefiled and upright to being unrighteous and wicked. To be found in him, that phrase, to be found in him, it just happened to be found in him, is H4672, which means that it came forth. It started to demonstrate itself. It started to show forth. It appeared to exist. And then it took hold of him. Ezekiel 28, 16. By the multitudes of thy merchandise or your trade, your trafficking. You want to know where human trafficking comes from? He's perfect at that. He says, by the multitude of thy merchandise, your trafficking. They have filled the midst of thee with violence and thou hast sinned. The things that he did filled him with violence. So the very things that he did filled him with violence. Therefore, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God. And I'm going to destroy you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. So Satan was cast out of heaven. Verse 17. Thine heart was lifted up because of your beauty. Thou hast corrupted your wisdom by reason of your brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. And the word reason, we reason, gets us in trouble. We use man's reasoning instead of God's reasoning. We try to figure things out, move things around, manipulate, control we're always trying to fix things and do things our own way instead of doing them God's way. Verse 18, thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquities of thy trafficking. There's that word again. It means merchandise. Therefore, will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee? So out of his very being will be fire. It shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. Verse 19. All they that know thee among the people shall be astounded. Who's going to be astounded? The ones that know him. You and I aren't going to be astounded. We read the word. We know what the word says. We know what his end is. But those who put their trust in him that know him, they're going to be astounded. He says, thou shalt be a terror and never shall thou be anymore. So it's those that know him. 
which means they have regard and respect for him. And this is his end. We know what the word says. We will not be astounded. So let me see now what Isaiah says over here in Isaiah 14, 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? So we know exactly who he's talking to now. How art thou cast down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? So this is the being that causes nations to be weakened. You want to look and see what's happening to our nation? You want to see what's happening, that it's being undermined? that our morals have gone to the gutter, that our finances are in trouble, that we're always in a war. You want to see who's behind that? Take a look and see. It's Satan himself. He is the motive behind all of it. He weakens the nations. And this is what Satan does. Weakens the nations. He appoints his fallen angels to be in charge of each nation from the second heaven, and his job is to destroy all of us. That's what his intention is. Isaiah 14 13, for thou hast said in your heart. So now we know what he's thinking in his heart. I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds and I will be like the most high. But this is what God says. Verse 15. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell. To the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look at thee. They'll squint their eyes and go, what? And consider thee and say, is this the man? Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms? Satan will die like a man. Verse 17, that made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof. He is destroying cities. We see that happening. That open not the house of his prisoners. He loves to keep the captives locked up. He loves to capture humankind and to hold them as prisoners. People are in prisons. They're in prisons of alcohol. They're in prisons of drugs. They're in prisons of addictions, of pride and arrogance and ungodliness. And their life is falling apart. And it's because Satan is attacking them. When all along God has the answers. So how did God handle this rebellion? First, he cast Satan out of heaven, and then he cast Adam out of the garden. But God has a remedy, because we just read Genesis 3.15. He will crush the head of the serpent. So Jesus, Yeshua, he comes as humankind in a body, lives a sinless life, and agreed to take the punishment for your sin and for mine. He nailed the law of sin and death to the cross. And in this life, we still have a physical death, but we don't have an eternal death if we're sold out to Yeshua, Jesus. And this is what Jesus did. According to Colossians 2, 14, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of legal demands which were in force against us. So God gave us the Old Testament with all of the laws, but what he did is he canceled out all of our sin and even the sins of our forefathers because he took the penalty for them. He says he canceled them out and which were hostile against us. So let me start again. Having canceled out the certificate of the debt consisting of legal demands, which were in force against us and which were hostile to us. And this certificate he has set aside and completely removed it by nailing it to the cross. He didn't nail the law of God to the cross or the law of Moses to the cross. He nailed the law of sin and death to the cross so that we can live an eternal life. He has conquered death for you and I. 
Verse 15, when he had disarmed the rulers and the authorities, those supernatural forces of evil operating against him, he made a public example of them and he exhibited at them as captives in his triumphal procession, having triumphant over them through the cross. Hallelujah. So he goes to hell. He takes the keys to death, hell, and the grave. All of these fallen angels have showed up to see the overthrow of Jesus. And instead, what does he do? He leads them in a procession as his captives. They thought they had him captivated. Instead, he turns around and he captures them and leads them in a triumphal procession. He makes a mockery of Satan himself. Satan did not know he was killing the Lord of glory or he would not have done it. The Bible tells us that. So 1 Peter 3.18 says, For indeed Christ died for sin once for all, the just and the righteous, which is Jesus, for the unjust and the unrighteous, which is you and me, the innocent for the guilty, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. So even though his flesh was killed, that spirit of God raised him up from the dead. And that same spirit dwells in you. If we're not raptured, we will experience a physical death of this flesh. But we will be made alive in the spirit. First Peter 3, 19, in which he also went and he preached to the spirits now in prison. And that's what I just described to you. Revelations 1.18 says, And the ever-living one, living in and beyond all time and space, he died. But see, I'm alive forevermore. And I have the keys of absolute control and victory over death. And Hades are the realm of the dead. He conquered it all. We are to armor up to fight spiritual battles with Christ. And so the complete Jewish Bible says it this way, Ephesians 6, 12. For we are not wrestling against human beings, but against rulers, against authorities, against cosmic powers governing this darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. Matthew 6, 19 says, after this manner, therefore pray, our Father which art in heaven, holy, holy, holy is your name. Thy kingdom come. We want to see God's kingdom come. We're not going to be so busy trying to get out of here that we can't keep praying for his kingdom to come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. We are to be warring for this kingdom to come. We have a job to do. Romans 16, 20 says this, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet, under your feet. The wonderful grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. And then Revelations 12, 11 says this, and they overcame and they conquered him because of the blood of the lamb and because of the words of their testimony. It's what we say with our mouth for they did not love their lives and renounce their faith. Even when faced with death. Wow. God, let it be. We have to love the next life more than we love this life. Now, here's the end of the story. Verse 11. Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he judges and he makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many, many, many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except him. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. That's who he is, the Word of God. That's how powerful this word is. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, that's us, fallen him on white horses. 
And now out of his mouth goes a shoot sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. So it's what comes out of his mouth that wins this war. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads out the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. He is executing the anger of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Revelations 20.10 And the devil who had deceived them was hurled into the lake of fire. That's his end. And burning brimstone, sulfur, where the beast are the Antichrist and the false prophet are also. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So maybe this took a little more than 15 minutes. But the truth is the truth. We can't serve two masters. We will love one and will hate the other. Matthew 6, 24 says, no one can serve two masters for either you're going to hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and you're going to despise the other. So in a nutshell, short little brief lesson here. I've given you the scriptures that describe our adversary, Satan, and who it is that we are wrestling with. The Bible is filled with concepts of living for Christ or choosing to live for yourself. At least now, if you didn't know or you weren't sure before, you know who your enemy is and you know his end. Fear, which is from Satan, it activates Satan. It draws him to you. Faith, on the other hand, draws God to you. It activates him. It gets his attention. He's going, he's got a spirit going to and fro throughout the earth, and he's looking to see whose antenna of faith is up there. That's where he's stopping. Stay in the word. It's the word that fights for you. And determined to see God's kingdom come on this earth and in your life. I hope this gives you a little bit of information about who the enemy is, how he got started, where he went wrong, so that you don't do what he does, so that you don't live in pride, you don't get into arrogance, you don't think you're all that in a bag of chips. Because there's no repentance for Satan. For you there is. You're a human being created in the image of God. If this was helpful for you, please give us a thumbs up, a like, subscribe, and please share this. And thank you so much for joining and taking the time to listen. Love somebody today. Show the love of God to those around you. Do something wonderful. Pray for people. See the kingdom come in other people's lives. I bless you, and I thank you for taking the time to watch. In Jesus' Yeshua's name, amen.